made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. The anointed one of God is an important person, of course. But the anointed one of God, as with King David, as with other righteous kings, is only anointed because God chooses to do it. One of the qualities of kingship in Israel that was most honored was wisdom. And David had wisdom of a kind, but he also did certain things that we would not consider wise. He, of course, stole someone's wife and had him killed. He did things to his enemies that were not what God would have him do. And yet the king continually sent him people like Nathan, the prophet, who helped him to understand his place. And David repented and changed his ways and that was considered wisdom in his time. But even Nathan gets it a little bit wrong when the king says to him, I would like to build a beautiful house for God because I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. And Nathan says, go, do all that you have in mind for the Lord is with you. Nathan hasn't received the message yet from God about what is supposed to happen with the building of God's house. And so he assumes, like most humans would, that the anointed one of God is always right. This is the problem, in some ways, with the power of God. The power of God is manifest on earth through human beings who are fallible creatures, through human beings who make terrible decisions sometimes, through human beings who wait a little bit too long to do what God wants. The manifestation of power through the people of Israel was through people that God called. And when the people God called were not doing the right thing, God called someone else to tell them that they were not doing the right thing. So it is with Nathan and David. Nathan is the one who tells David he's done the wrong thing when he steals Uriah's wife. Nathan is the one who has spent time with David and gotten to know him and knows how to tell him the truth. Nathan has a relationship with David, the anointed one of God, that allows him to say, oops, oops. You're wrong. And when the word of the Lord comes to Nathan, and Nathan goes to David, it's a little bit funny. It's a little bit funny, the word that God gives to David. He says, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? This is the kind of funny question that God asks people in the Hebrew Scriptures. Are you the one? Is it right for you to do this? Should you be the one doing this? It's usually before he says, don't. Don't do it because I'm going to do something else. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. Wherever I've moved about, among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Why have you not built me a house of cedar? And then, of course, the Lord reminds David of who he is, that he is a shepherd boy that God 
has raised up to be king over Israel, and that God has always been with him, and that God has always been faithful in telling him what to do. And so the Lord says to David, you will not build me a house. He says, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. The Lord will make him a house. His family will rule Israel forever. But it also means that of David, the Lord will make a house. The Lord will build his presence on earth out of David out of this person. So then many, many years later, in the period of the second temple, when people in the Israelite religious community were divided about exactly what would happen with the Messiah and whether they ought to take more of an active stance toward bringing about the kingdom of God, there were three factions. There were people like the Essenes who wanted to pray and wait for God intentionally, but not really doing a whole lot to move God along. There were the Sadducees who really believed that now was the time and people should do things to bring about the kingdom of God. And there were the Pharisees who were kind of somewhere in between and they were teaching people about how to live righteously, but also telling them that the power in the end to remake the world was God's. So these people were debating that, much as we do now, much as we talk about whether we should just wait for God to do things or whether we should take action for social justice, whether we should say, well, God's got it, or whether we should do things more proactively to try to help the world become what God wants. The truth is, it is not for us to build a house for God. Neither was it for David. And yet, God did have a house built for him. It was by David's son, Solomon, who asked for the wisdom of God so that he could discern how to rule the people. He was the one who built the house of God out of cedar because it was the right time because it was the time of God's choosing to settle in that place. For us, it is a struggle to wait. It has always been a struggle to wait. And here we are in the fourth week of Advent, and the kingdom of God is near, and yet it is still far away. We are still experiencing the many difficulties of our unequal society. We're still experiencing people who will be evicted if we don't get it together so that they can get some relief. We're still experiencing people dying for no reason because we can't choose to do the public health measures that we need to. We are, as always, struggling with the poverty in our world, with those who are hungry and those who are lonely and those who are struggling with many, many challenges. We are still suffering these things. And yet God will make a house for himself to dwell in. And God will direct the renewing of the world. The historian and theologian N.T. Wright has a really good take on the power of God. and I'm going to share it with you. The power of God is a complex thing, and it's hard to understand how God could both be all-powerful and how God could want to work through humble creatures like us. Power is something we often say in a negative way, that things that are done for power are cannot be done for good reasons and things that are done in the name of God should not be done in a way that shows power. But that's not how God worked in the scriptures. So for N.T. Wright, let us say this. The initial biblical answer to the question about power then 
is that power undoubtedly has an important place within the Creator's purpose for the world. But that like justice, freedom, and all the rest, it can be, and regularly is, corrupted in ways that seem to undermine any chance of its being a signpost to ultimate truth about God and the world. But in fact, power really is a signpost of that kind, since it points to the fact that the Creator intended and still intends that his world should be ordered, not chaotic, fruitful, not wasteful, glorifying to him rather than shameful. And the central design the creator God has put in place to accomplish this is his delegation of his power to his image-bearing human creatures. God is quite capable, of course, of acting directly in the world, though even then, the Bible often reckons with humans being taken up into this work as well, if only by their lament and intercession. But God, it seems, made a world designed to work through human agency, against the day when he would come as a genuine human to take charge of his world himself. God has designed the world to work through humans and given us the power to help. Mary knows this. And when Mary is confronted with the angel Gabriel, when Mary listens and asks questions about the Annunciation, when she says, how can this be, since I am a virgin, she knows, she knows that God will build a house out of her and that it is hard to build a house out of a person, a house, meaning a group of people born of a person, without the scientific way that people get pregnant. And then the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. She knows. She knows the same way that David knows when the Lord tells him directly, I will make a house for you. I will make a house of you. When Mary accepts and she says, here I am, here am I, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word, it is the same thing David would have said when he was anointed. It is the same thing the prophets said, usually after a little bit of arguing with God. How can this be? I'm not the right person. <laughs> you can't do this with me. And then God does it. God says, I will do it with you. And they accept in their own agency the truth about God, that the power of God that overshadows them is the power for the recreation of the world. Mary then gives what many people have said is a prophetic utterance, the Magnificat that we said earlier today. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And then she tells us what God's power does. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. The lowly are the wise. The lowly are the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy. The promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. The promise that he would make a house that would bless the whole world. Mary is not just the queen of heaven because the church has decided that about her. Mary is not the queen because we made it that way out of some sort of, you know, lifting up a woman so we have something to point to. 
No, Mary is the queen because she's married to Joseph, who is of David, the house that God created. Mary is meeting the angel on her own terms, negotiating for her own purpose, and accepting what God offers her out of the wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of David, the wisdom of all the prophets before her, who believes, the wisdom of one who understands and believes that nothing will be impossible with God, and that we are meant to play a part in God's renewing of the world. It is a mystery how long we wait, how much we do, whether we sit and say, God has it, I don't need to do anything, or we try to do something to help. The wisdom to know when to say, yes, I will do this, or no, it is not for me to do. The wisdom comes from God. And if we pray, we receive these kinds of messages. And if we listen to these messages, we are given the power of God, the strength that overshadows everything and makes possible all the life in the world. May you receive the power of God this week and into Christmas. May you experience the way that you, a humble human being, are called to be an agent of God. May you say, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. <laughs>